This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. This is a very special evening for IPJ, as our esteemed guest has been very active in two countries that many, as many of you know the IPJ has a strong interest in. First, we've been working in Nepal for the past 10 years, where in 2006 the Maoist rebels agreed to a comprehensive peace agreement, paving the way for them to participate in future governments and address the issue eventually of child combatants. Thousands of Nepalese army soldiers returned to their barracks. Maoist rebels, including those under the age of 18, were confined to cantonment sites across the country to prevent any further outbreak of violence. In January 2010, the roughly 3,000 identified child soldiers who had served in the Maoist People's Liberation Army were discharged and released from the cantonments. A lot of that process leading up to that was indeed uh, about integrating these youth back into their communities with training and support, and that's ongoing. And Radhika Kumaraswamy, with the Office of Children and Armed Conflict, along with the UN Mission in Nepal and UNICEF and the government of Nepal, have all played an active role in this process. Chris Groth and I just returned from Nepal last Friday, and while there's still a considerable amount of political instability, well, we're doing the best we can uh, in the country, both the Nepal Army and the Maoists continue to state publicly that they are committed to not recruiting anyone under the age of 18. The IPJ is working with several youth groups and emerging leaders in Nepal to make sure that the concerns of youth are addressed as the country moves forward to a new democracy. The IPJ is uh, expanding its work also with women peacemakers in the Philippines. Well, we have three women peacemakers. There, the Office of Children and Armed Conflict has been very active, and there, Under Secretary Kumaraswamy has just secured an agreement with the rebel group, the MILF, to address these issues about child recruits. The IPJ leaves again next week for the Philippines, where in addition to working with three former women peacemakers on the issues of ceasefire monitoring, the World Link short documentary film, Mindanao's Youth Working for Peace, profiling the experiences and strategies of grassroots youth leaders from uh, the Moro or Muslim, Christian and indigenous communities of Mindanao will be shared as it has been here with our World Link community in Mexico and the US. Of course, uh, we continue to work with young people here and in our area, and at this time, it's my pleasure to invite the IPJ World Link Program Officer, Carla Alvarez, who manages our youth program here and who created the Mindanao Film on Youth to introduce tonight's speaker, Carla. Thank you, Dee. It is my honor to introduce Radhika Kumar Swami, United Nations Under Secretary General, Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict, as tonight's Joan B. Kroc Distinguished Lecture Series speaker. As you may have already seen from the program, Ms. Kumar Swami has an extensive amount of experience addressing human rights, social justice, and gender equality. She is a tireless advocate and has been described by her colleagues as a brilliant scholar. Since 2006, Ms. Kumara Swamy has had the challenging job of protecting children and young people in the midst of violence and oppression. A United Nations World Youth Report recently found that overwhelmingly young people feel that their voices do not matter and that they cannot make a difference. While they are consistently ignored by policymakers, Ms. Kumara Swamy is someone who does listen to them. In fact, she recently wrote in an op-ed that while she may forget the, voices, the faces of the numerous governmental officials and NGO representatives she often meets with, she never forgets the faces and voices of the victims. 
The IPJ's WorldLink program also recognizes the importance of the voices of the youth. Over the past 14 years, WorldLink has included more than 9,000 high school students from San Diego and Baja California. They show us that young people are deeply passionate about their futures and are committed to addressing social injustice. We often hear from former WorldLink students later on who share how important it was to have a space for their voices to be heard and valued, and as a result, continue to consult young people in their own work today. In this, the 10th anniversary year of the IPJ, it is my pleasure to announce tonight that the WorldLink program recently received a generous $30,000 donation. This gift will enable WorldLink to reach out to low-income and Mexican youth and to continue its international expansion to connect local students to the plight of youth in other countries. If you would like to learn, If you would like to learn how you can match this grant and support youth as agents of change, please feel free to use the donation envelope in your program or see an IPJ staff member following the talk. For the past year, the WorldLink youth have been discussing human trafficking and the small arms trade, crimes that know no borders and leave a deadly, painful trail. Children are one of the most vulnerable groups during and after conflict. After losing siblings, parents, and other relatives, they are left defenseless and as such targeted for human trafficking and child soldiers. Among several initiatives, Ms. Kumaraswamy is leading a global campaign to stop the recruitment of children under the age of 18 by armed groups. Her office is working on a wide range of violations against children in 22 different conflict zones, and Ms. Kumaraswamy has made personal visits to many of them, including recent visits to Somalia to address the issue of children being recruited into piracy, Kenya, where young people were involved in post-election violence, Afghanistan, and the Philippines, where she just secured an action plan to remove children from armed conflict. Before I invite Ms. Kumaraswamy to the stage, inside your program is a question card for you to fill and give to ushers during the question and answer session. And now I invite the students, faculty, and community members gathered here tonight to join me in welcoming Radhika Kumaraswamy, United Nations Under Secretary General, Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict. Hello. I want to begin by thanking everyone at the Institute for Peace and Justice for inviting me to this very vibrant community and for sharing this evening with me. When I was in Uganda recently, I met Moy, a young man who had struggled to reach a UNICEF camp after years with the Lord's Resistance Army. When he was just 13, he and his friend were playing when the LRA attacked their village. Moy and his friend were abducted and made to carry the products of the LRA looting on their heads back to the LRA camp. On the way, his friend slipped and broke his ankle. The LRA commander shot his friend in the head. They made their way to the camp where he was made into a fighter. He watched as those who tried to run away were executed. He was given drugs, shot into his left temple, and then made to fight, usually attacking his own network of villages and killing people he knew well. Finally, he had had enough. He escaped from the camp and made his way to an NGO funded by UNICEF. The NGO was trying to trace his family, and he was undergoing counseling and being provided with training in vocational skills. Of all the humanitarian issues prevalent in the world today, the theme of children in armed conflict has caught the imagination of the Security Council of the United Nations. Since 2000, there has been a systematic engagement with the CAC agenda, as it is called, in UN circles, much of it in the form of what I would term an experiment. What I propose to do today is to first describe the background to this engagement, then move on to describe the nature of the Security Council engagement and finally, to reflect upon the implications of such an engagement for human rights issues and children in armed conflict. In 1996, 
Grace Michelle, the wife of Nelson Mandela, presented her in-depth expert study on children and armed conflict to the General Assembly. Responding to the terrible news stories of children in conflict, the Assembly had asked the expert to provide guidance on what was necessary at the international level to protect children in times of conflict. Grace Michelle, in her report, highlighted the fact that contemporary warfare was changing, that the lines between civilian and combatant were no longer clear, that women and children were often on the front line and directly targeted. While the Security Council in earlier years were concerned about drawing lines between combatants, today one of its primary concerns is the protection of civilians. Rasa Michel went on to signal issues that required urgent international attention. These included the issue of child soldiers, the problem of refugees and IDP children, sexual and gender-based violence, and the effect of landmines on children. She also drew attention to the particular problems posed by generalized sanctions, the terrible impact of warfare on health and nutrition, and the need for psychological recovery and the social integration of all children affected by war. The General Assembly res responded to her by creating the post of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict at the level of the Under Secretary General to mobilize a UN system-wide effort to protect children in times of war. Olara Otuno, who inherited the mantle, was appointed the first special rep representative on children in armed conflict. Olara Otuno was Uganda's ambassador when Uganda was a member of the Security Council, and he saw the potential for the Security Council engagement on this issue. He was determined to make the Security Council recognize the children in armed conflict is a peace and security issue under the Council's purview, and the full plethora of tools that the Council had at its disposal had the real potential of driving this agenda with the political muscle of the Security Council behind it. Security Council engagement with the issue of children in armed conflict began in 1999, when the Council in Resolution 1261 requested the Secretary General to provide a report on children in armed conflict to the Council, cementing the recognition sought by Otuno that children in armed conflict was a peace and security issue. This regular report has become the basis for ongoing Security Council action on this issue. The first important decision made by the former Special Representative was to guide the Security Council process to focus on grave violations against children and to focus on specific incidents and actual perpetrators. This was revolutionary in the Council, let alone the United Nations, where most thematic debates usually spoke in generalities. It was felt that programmatic reviews would be misplaced since the Council was not a response mechanism, but that grave violations elements of threats to peace and security would be important for its deliberations. After reviewing international humanitarian law, the former Special Representative identified six grave violations that occur against children during wartime. The killing and maiming of children, sexual violence against children, recruitment and use of children, abduction, attacks on schools and hospitals, and denial of humanitarian access. These were not comprehensive. For example, they did not deal with forced displacement, but they were the most practicable in terms of monitoring. These six grave violations have now become the basis of the Security Council process. If one examines the 2009 report of the Secretary General of Children of Armed Conflict, the focus is on violations and compliance by parties within country-specific situations. With regard to country situations, they were divided into two, countries that are on the agenda of the Security Council and countries not on the agenda of the Council. In all, there are 20 country situations of concern. If one looks at the text within these country situations, for example, Iraq, it examines issues such as the recruitment of children, killing and maiming of children, children in detention because of recruitment, as well as issues relating to attacks on educational institutions. The report presents certain statistics, but the main thrust of the reporting is incident-based reporting with an attempt to identify perpetrators where possible. 
Since it is the Secretary General's report, the process of writing this report with country-specific information is also unique and interesting. The information for the violations comes from the UN country team itself. This information, along with other rele relevant information at headquarters, is collated and put together by my office. The report is then shared with the headquarters level task force made up of all the relevant UN agencies, including UNICEF, DPKO, UNHCR, UNIFEM, OLA. After their inputs, the report is then finalized, sent up to the Secretary General, who makes the final changes before the report finally comes out. In the end, we can generally say that the compilation of the annual report of the Secretary General to the Security Council on children and armed conflict is a UN system-wide process. The process is important in itself, since it is a consensus building tool for UN partners as how to best protect children. It contains information that the UN system has access to and that can be verified by UN partners. We only use non-UN material if the country teams for some reason feel that they cannot monitor, report, or verify information. In that case, we use official sources as well as information from other child protection partners. We feel that the data is credible and is based on sound methodology. One of the first legal issues to emerge in the compilation of the report was what constituted armed conflict for the purpose of the report. No country wants to be in a Security Council report. In internal war, regardless of how large the conflict, all countries tell me they are not a situation of armed conflict, but that they're engaging in a police operation. The response of our office is that our determination was derived from a humanitarian angle with a pragmatic emphasis on children, what happens to them, and how they can best be protected. This approach puts the interests of children as an overriding concern, and that situations requiring scrutiny should be responded to without a legal determination of what constitutes armed conflict. With the help of the Secretary General's Office and the Office of Legal Affairs, along with language in the recent Security Council Resolution 1882, we examine what we now call situations of concern. An inclusion of a country situation in our report is not a legal determination of armed conflict. Still, many countries continue to resist their inclusion with demarches and strong language at the open debates that often accompanies the production of the report. One important aspect of the reporting to the Council that is also included in the annual report is the emphasis on peacekeeping. In recent times, UN peacekeeping has grown exponentially in most many parts of the world, especially Africa. Increasing their mandate is changing from being neutral observers to a more active role in protecting civilians, especially in the Congo. From the very first report on children in armed conflict, there was an attempt to ensure that UN peacekeeping missions respond to children's concerns. The report to the Council highlighted the need for UN Security Council resolutions setting up peacekeeping operations to include provisions on child protection. The reports also call for training of peacekeepers and for being useful in monitoring sexual violence and exploitation by peacekeepers themselves against children. As a result of all this emphasis, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations has formulated a child protection policy. This policy calls for the recruitment of child protection advisors as requested by the Security Council who would help the missions monitor grave violations along with UNICEF and other child protection partners, train peacekeepers, and be the advocate and the interface between peacekeepers, civil society, and children in the community. The second initiative with regard to the Security Council and children armed conflict took place in 2001 when the Council requested that the Secretary General in his annual report also include an annex of named parties that continue to recruit and use children as child soldiers. This issue with child soldiers was of particular concern to the Council since Grasa Michelle highlighted the issue in a study and most council members considered this a universally abhorrent practice. Pictures of small children carrying automatic weapons, killing and maiming under the influence of drugs had blooded, flooded the media ever since the wars in Liberia and Sierra Leone. This was deemed to be an unacceptable state of affairs. The council therefore decided on a very unique process, a listing process, a naming and shaming exercise 
that would indicate to the world that the perp who the perpetrators are, their names, and where they are located. The first list of shame contained the names of 23 parties, state and non-state actors, from Afghanistan to Sierra Leone. By 2009, there were over 50 listed parties. Over the years, the numbers have increased as data availability increased. There was also greater specificity as to, fo as to the focus of security action as well. Today, there are 19 persistent violators who have been on the list for at least five years. Resolutions 1379 of 2001 also indicate how parties could get off this list. They have to enter into time-bound action plans with the United Nations to release and reintegrate the children in a structured manner, to desist from further recruitment, and to take action against members of their group that recruit children. The action plan also requires that monitors be allowed unhindered access to barracks, training camps, and installations to verify that there are no children. This action plan then became the vehicle for delisting parties that allowed the United Nations to receive and implement commit commitments. There are people who are skeptical about all this, of the listing process. It is true that a number of parties do not care and sometimes are unaware if they're listed by the Secretary General. I do not think Al-Qaeda or Al-Shabaab in Somalia particularly care whether they are on any Security Council list. But in many cases, the listing process has resulted in compliance. For example, in 2008, I visited the Central African Republic and met with Commandant Laurent of the APRDC. He lived deep in the bush and did not have much access to international news. I informed him that he was on the annexes of the Secretary General's report and, and, and about Security Council Resolution 1612 and that there was the possibility of targeted sanctions against him in the future. He was initially taken aback, turned hostile, and gave me a long lecture, his unique version of world history and of the United Nations. However, even though he was a rebel now, he had aspirations of leading the country one day. He did not want to be on any list. He made a commitment to release the children as long as there were proper programs in place for their care. He has currently released, I think, over 650 children in a structured manner and all separated children have now been reintegrated into their communities. In Dece December 2008, I met with the MILF, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, in their territory in a remote part of Mindanao, Philippines. Though initially they were reluctant to cede any ground, first claiming that they did not have children, and then stating that Muslim law defines children differently, they finally relented once the process was explained to them and the cost of remaining on the list made clear. They too wanted to be off this list. Over the course of 2009, they entered into an action plan with the United Nations. A similar change of heart took place in Nepal after prolonged negotiations. In February 2010, the Nepalese Maoists released their 3,000 minors who had been held in cantonments. Again, they felt that as a past and possible future ruling party, they should not be on the, Secretary, on the Security Council's list. In April, I was in the Philippines and met the MILF again. Having identified the first caseload of children, they were making plans with UNICEF and ILO for programs for the reintegration of these children, for the provision of schools and vocational training. The process is slow, but we hope it will gather momentum so that we can delist the MILF. The new Philippine government is also very supportive of our work. They feel such interaction strengthens the peace process and allows communities to further value the future of their children. I also began in the Philippines exploratory talks with the NPA, the New People's Army, the communist insurgency in the center of the Philippines, and we will soon begin discussions with them in Utrecht over the possibility of an action plan. Again, they are a recalcitrant group in most of their dealings, but they too do not want to be on the wrong side of the Security Council. We have also had successes with non-state actors in Cote d'Ivoire, Sri Lanka, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Sudan. Governments, too, do not want to be any, on any Security Council list of shame. As soon as Uganda was listed, they began discussions with our office, concluded an action plan, and are now delisted. We noticed children in the Afghan police force 
The moment they were listed, Afghanistan authorities began discussions on an action plan, and in February I went to Kabul for the signing of such a plan, which we hope will be implemented successfully. We're also moving forward on an action plan with the Myanmarese government, and we hope to conclude such a plan before the end of the year. In August 2009, the Security Council, recognizing the effectiveness of this listing process with regard to children in armed conflict in certain contexts, asked the Secretary General to expand the scope of his annexes and also list parties that kill and maim children and commit sexual violence against children. The 2010 and 2011 reports, therefore, now contain additional listings of such parties. The listing criteria for these violations are premised on the notion of a pattern. The violations cannot be random or isolated. They must be systematic, willful, and intentional. This now poses a challenge, as we will require my office and partners in the field to gather the kind of information that will meet the standard for this new criteria. The most significant development with regard to children in calm conflict and the Security Council took place in 2005 with the passage of the Security Council Resolution 1612. The resolution called on the Secretary General to set up a monitoring and reporting mechanism and created a Security Council working group on children in armed conflict. The notion that the Security Council would set up a monitoring and reporting mechanism on anything seemed unthinkable at one time. In fact, it is important to remember that, that the Council for many years refused even to consider human rights issues or allow the High Commissioner for Human Rights to address them. The setting up of a monitoring and reporting mechanism was therefore a sea change. For the sake of children, a unity of purpose was found. Nevertheless, safeguards were in place to ensure the fact that nation states would be fully consulted and their interests protected. Assurances were given and processes set in place for effective action. In May 2005, the resolution was unanimously adopted, much to everyone's surprise. It was, after all, for the sake of children who could publicly oppose such noble sentiments. The monitoring and reporting mechanism, as initially designed by Laura Tuno and the modified in consultation with partners, established United Nations task forces at country level to, pay, to be chaired by the highest UN representative and co-chaired by UNICEF. In some countries, the representative of the Human Rights High Commissioner is also there as a co-chair. This task force Members include all UN departments and agencies, as well as independent NGOs and independent human rights communities. All information collected by non-UN partners must be verified by the UN. This task force, then sends, which is based on incidents and perpetrators, sends its report to office where it is processed in consultation uh, with UNICEF, DPK, DPA, and DPKO at headquarters. Finally, the document appears as a Secretary General's report on the country concerned. Again, it is a system-wide report of the United Nations based on six grave violations. However, unlike the annual report, these detailed reports, country reports, allows for a fuller appreciation of background information and other efforts taken to protect children. Many governments in these situations of concern had an initial reaction to the fact that they were not represented in these task forces due to concerns for neutrality and impartiality. We argue that those against whom there were possible allegations cannot be on the task force. However, practice is emerging where all the government agencies that deal with children form a government working group which then interacts with this task force. In this way, the government may be aware of the type of allegations against it, and also most important, become very useful in responding to these violations through providing services for affected children. The reports of the Secretary General on country situations are presented to another innovative creation of the Security Council, Resolution 1612, a special working group of the Security Council on Children and Armed Conflict. In the first few years, it was chaired by France, then it was chaired by Mexico, and today it is chaired by Germany. Therefore, we have a very special mechanism of the Security Council purely devoted to children in armed conflict. It meets every two months and examines the report of the Secretary General, as well as my oral and written reports from the field. This systematic 
engagement with frequent meetings has deepened the engagement and created a class of technical experts with a specialized knowledge base on issues related to children in armed conflict. When the country report is presented, the working group then moves on to creating and deliberating on conclusions and recommendations. Since its inception, the working group has come to a consensus on all the country-specific situations placed before it. There has never been an instance of complete deadlock. I urge you to go to our website and read these conclusions and recommendations by the Security Council Working Group on specific countries. You will be surprised about how engaging they are and how comprehensive, given the fact that these are member states who are talking about other member states and who have such difficulty because of their defense of sovereignty. This again speaks volumes for the fact that children's issues are a unifying factor. The Security Council Working Group in its initial sessions also fashioned a toolkit of possible actions it could take. There's a scope for country visits by the Security Council Working Group. Recently, it went to Nepal, and this year, it, is hope it, it will go to Afghanistan. Interestingly, both Russia and China, normally very skeptical about these intrusive mechanisms, also participated in the visit. Processing an average 12 reports a year and coming up with the same number of conclusions and recommendations has resulted in an enormous workload for the working group. But perhaps the most important aspect of Security Council Resolution 1612 is that it threatens action against persistent violators. The structure of the resolution, the gathering of information that attempts to address accountability all point to perhaps one of the most important parts of the resolution, that those who persist in committing grave violations against children may be at the receiving end of targeted measures, which include an arms embargo, assets freeze, and travel bans. The mere threats of these sanctions was enough for some parties to enter into action plans, particularly all five parties in Cote d'Ivoire. In other contexts where the international system is rejected, this threat may fall, of course, on deaf ears. Nevertheless, it is an important aspect of 1612. The only institution within the UN that is capable of a punitive response is the Security Council. It is for this reason that this complex exercise was initially begun and why it is important that we move ahead uh, with this process. In August 2009, Again, the Council reiterated that sanctions should be used against perpetrators. An important step forward in the Sanctions Committee deliberations on the Democratic Republic of Congo, after I addressed them, sanctions have now been imposed against individuals for the recruitment and use of children. However, there is no separate sanctions mechanism for children in armed conflict, and many feel the Council should move forward in this direction. The issue of sanctions committee listing and punishment was before the House of Lords recently and before the European Court. Certain important issues were raised, and I know there are some people from the law school here, such as the fact that those against whom sanctions are imposed, if they are individuals, should be given the opportunity to be heard, the evidence should be communicated to them, and there should be some form of judicial review. These are important safeguards and it is my understanding that the Council is seeking to make necessary adjustments so that due process is fulfilled. Nevertheless, since the sanctioned power of the Security Council remains the only punitive power within the system to deal with states and parties, we should not forsake this power, and it should be strengthened so that human rights protection is also embedded. Reflecting back on the five years after Resolution 1612 was adopted, one may recognize certain issues and problems. The first question that comes to mind is, should we have brought these issues before the Security Council? The Council deals with armed conflict, and this is about children in the midst of that conflict. For that reason alone, the Council has a mandate to deal with these issues. As I said, the Council has the power to punish those who are a threat to peace and security, those who commit horrendous violations with children, surely fall within that category. By recognizing the link between the protection of children and the threat to peace and security, the Council has shown that it is willing to recognize a more comprehensive view of its role and mandate. In recent times, it has also recognized the importance of the protection of women and the protection of civilians. 
In modern wars, where the separation of civilian and combatants is rarely acknowledged, this holistic approach displays a better understanding of the true dynamics of modern warfare. And yet the Security Council is essentially a political body, and we should not forget that. Where countries agree on political issues, or the members of the Council, such as, for example, in Burundi, we have been able to move the agenda effectively. Where there are contested political issues, it is more difficult. This has made many critics charge that the UN system has double standards, that some states are more protected than others. For all of us who work in human rights within the UN system, we recognize that double standards do exist. But our policy has always been where we can protect human rights, we should do so with effectiveness. Where it is more difficult because of political reasons, we should still continue to advocate for the system to recognize human rights and child protection standards. Just because there are double standards because of politics, we cannot in operate in a world without any standards. There is something disingenuous about the statement that just because we cannot protect all the children all the time, we should not protect some of the children when we can. Surely that cannot be the valid approach. The other factor that is important to keep in mind is that this is process is described above is about before the Security Council and not the Human Rights Council. The reason for this, as stated earlier, is that children in armed conflict is a peace and security issue since it involves armed conflict. And we also hope that the Council would move toward targeted measures. As a result, the process has been somewhat different. From the beginning, member states made it clear that this should be a consultative and collaborative process, and they placed a high value on engaging nation states in dealing with grave violations. The third important aspect is that any report that goes to the Council as a that this report goes to the Council as a Secretary General's report. It is not the report of a special rapporteur or, or a special representative. As a result, there's a great deal of consultation within the UN system before the report is finalized. This allows for a UN system-wide monitoring and UN system-wide coherent response. One important factor to note is the position of our development and humanitarian actors who feel that this naming and shaming exercise may affect their work. UNICEF is often in a position in which it works closely with government with regard to average programs, and then suddenly has to take on this monitoring exercise. Many of the agents find this difficult. Increasingly, we're trying to shield country programs by taking the political heat in New York. I feel that's the role of my office. And, but, the, for, but the collection of information must be verified by the UN at the country level. The Security Council experiment on children in armed conflict has been an interesting one. A council, once allergic to human rights issues, has set up a working group, a monitoring and reporting mechanism, works with lists of shame, naming perpetrators, and is considering targeted measures against individuals for violations against children. The excitement caused by this experiment has led others to try and see whether some of the lessons learned could be applied to other issues, such as sexual violence and conflict and the protection of civilians. The next few years may actually see a deepening engagement of the Council on all these protection issues, and we must recognize that the children have shown the way. As Grasa Michelle did write in a report, children are a unifying factor, and they, more than any other group, remind us of our common ethical concerns. I have described to you the response of the Security Council to some of these challenges. Like all systems, it has its imperfections, but one must still conclude that these are extraordinary and innovative developments. Recently, we brought to the Security Council a young girl who once was a child soldier raped, beaten, and nearly killed by, again by the Lord's Resistance Army. She rebuilt her life as, and is now a graduate student in a prestigious American university. After her moving intervention, she received sustained response from em every ambassador in the room, along with the Secretary General. Those are special moments when our common humanity trumps our politics. They're also moments that show us the possibility of the United Nations. We hope, again, that the children will continue to show us the way. Thank you.
can you speak a little bit to the nature of civil society's uh, consultations done with your office and or the nature of civil society analysis and advocacy? Is it, you know, what role does it play? Well, I have a civil society advisory council that we meet once every two months. Uh, so I, I, and on it are Save the Children, Oxfam, Care, Human Rights Watch, World Vision, um, War Child, uh, um, International Crisis Group. So all of these are uh, part of the advisory group and they meet me regularly. Uh, and of course, in our work, especially on issues such as this, there's no doubt that the initial ideas uh, come from civil society. You know, this whole cause, really even the notion, why did they appoint Grasa Michelle? They appointed Grasa Michelle because NGOs working in the field were saying these terrible things are happening to children. So one has to realize that really the life force of all our mandates uh, really uh, come from uh, civil society in the country areas. Uh, they're the ones who first direct us to what's uh, taking place. So they're really important to us uh, in prevention. They're important to us in monitoring, and they're also important to us in response, both at, in the field and headquarters. And they have done a sterling, the Security Council process, they do half the lobbying. You know, we can't really lobby member states. We are UN officials. Uh, we can, uh, you know, make presentations, et cetera, but it's basically our civil society, um, child rights groups from all over the world that uh, lobbied Security Council members to pass 1612 and all the others. So they're very active. Uh, could you give us some more information or elaborate a bit on how the UN has played a role in controlling the LRA, or has it, with their, their you know, experience with children in Uganda? Well, the LRA, you know, is one of the issues that the UN is actually internally divided by. Um, which is that, um, interestingly, uh, you have one wing of the UN that is trained to make peace. And to them, peace is the most important uh, uh, issue. So uh, talking, negotiating, coming to terms. And then you have another part of the UN which is very human rights and justice oriented, like the High Commissioner's Office for Human Rights, OLA, uh, and uh, so they're constantly debating. So we have the part, well, not so much now, but earlier saying we must make peace with the LRA and the other part saying, you know, make peace, this man must be in jail. I mean, he, there's no making peace with this man. Uh, so, so this debate, as you know, we had an envoy who was speaking, and then, of course, the, the part of the international community dealing with justice then indicted Coney in the middle of the peace talks, which sent the UN peace negotiators into a complete flurry. Uh, and then, of course, Coney, once he was indicted, uh, stopped speaking, and now he's in, going up uh, uh, Central African Republic, heading towards Sudan now in these little groups that have uh, broken up. So now everybody is fed up with him, even though he's now, uh, the Ugandan army has, has now uh, pursued him uh, and basically had some military successes. So now this group is very splintered and small little kind of bandit groups working through that area. So now there is, um, uh, everybody's just fed up with them because they just uh, create this instability as they go um, from the Congo to the South Sudan to the Central African Republic. Uh, I mean, not major devastation, but just constant insecurity because of their presence. So now what has happened is uh, the UN has now decided that it's going to have a regional approach to the LRA. So what we're doing is that all the UN offices are going to have a regional plan to first, the peacekeepers also, to come to protect civilians. And the AU is also, the African Union is also going to have a regional plan. So we're going to now try and deal with them regionally, both militarily with the Ugandan government in the lead, as well as responding uh, to uh, that. So no one is talking about talking to them at the moment. So there's going to be a regional military strategy and a regional response strategy to what is happening. So that's what's happening at the moment. I think there are a few other country questions, and one, I'm curious about this one too. Can you please provide an update on the efforts to rehabilitate the 3,000 former Maoist child soldiers back into society in Nepal? Have these efforts been successful? Partly successful. Um, 
what we are hearing the last few months is that the Maoist commanders have maintained contact with some of these miners and are urging them to join the youth political wings. Now, this is also interesting. Now, how do we respond to that? They stop being combatants, and then they're recruited to the youth wings of the political parties. Uh, and strictly, we can't say they can't because, we, because it's not a violation. Uh, so, um, so there's that going on, which we're not happy about. The other is some of the girls who have gone back just do not want to, you know, they've been soldiers, some of them commanders, go back into really conservative Hindu society and sit in the back room and wear a sari. They're, they're just not at all happy about being docile. Um, and so they have um, uh, responded by saying they don't want to go home, they want to go back to the cantonment, so they're having some problems with them and trying to see uh, how we can deal with that issue. There's some issues with regard to them. But um, so, so some, some have accepted the packages of training and are moving on. Some are still having kind of a petticoat, uh, holding on to the commanders of the Maoists. And some like the women, you know, want another way. They want to go and live in Kathmandu on their own and things like that. So. But now they're reaching adulthood, so I suppose that can be done at times. One more country question. Do you have any information on Burundi? Ah. Yes, well, Burundi, as, uh, as you know, uh, um, I must say I haven't recently. I know there is some trouble brewing recently, but until about six months ago, we had delisted all the parties. Uh, um, uh, we got them to uh, uh, release uh, or all, all parties released their children to UNICEF. South Africa, to some extent, uh, helped us in the negotiations. As you know, South Africans were ahead in that peace process in Burundi. Uh, so they have been uh, released. One of the things uh, that I want to do this year, perhaps, is to do a tour of the countries in which the children were released and to see how the reintegration has taken place. So Sierra Leone, Liberia, Burundi to just see how the actual reintegration is taking place. There are talks, of course, of Burundi going back to war. Um, so we have, we're watching the situation cl closely to see if new ch uh, children are being recruited. Um, has the council investigated the recruitment of children in the United States uh, as a result of no child left behind? That's the rest of the question here. <laughs> No child left behind. I that's, that's just that's the educational act. Yeah. No, no. But I mean, but let's leave that part out and just say, has the council ever investigated recruitment of children in the U.S. into military service below the age of 18? Well, so. well, U.S., Britain, and all give us a little bit of a heartache because their recruitment age is 17, as you know. But the but as a result, the optional protocol uh, made it clear uh, that you can recruit children between 16 and 18 if you do not put them in combat. So the US abides by that. It does not put anyone under 18 in direct combat, but they, you can be recruited between 16 and 18. Sandhurst and so I think, I don't know about West Point, is that a, that is, oh, yes. So I think, I think children can be uh, recruited, but uh, do not put into combat. But of course, the NGOs are pushing for a straight 18, as you know, as, as is our campaign. Uh, Europe has more or less fallen in line with the straight 18. Netherlands was, except for Britain, uh, Netherlands was the last holdout, but now they have a straight 18 policy. But the US, UK, um, and all the British colonies, what is interesting about colonialism, that everybody uh, mimics the mother country. So the mother country says 17, so all the British colonies also have 17 as the age of uh, recruitment. Okay. Well, obviously, with all the countries we've covered, all the things you're doing, here's a good question. How large a staff do you have to conduct the important work? And Not enough. <laughs> and the other part of that question, obviously, because we have students here, is uh, what's their background and training? Well, the staff we have, I have only 15 people, but, but I also have UNICEF and the child protection officers of GPKO. So, 
So though we do a lot of the collating of the reports and whatever, I work very, UNICEF work very closely with the whole part of UNICEF that deals with armed conflict, which is the emergency section of UNICEF, uh, very closely uh, with them, as well as uh, with uh, the peacekeeping operations, child protection unit. So they are my field presence. So our New York office is, 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 is 15. Their background is um, in human rights, uh, in child protection, mainly. The, the, those are the two areas uh, that we look for. And we look for a lot of field experience, especially in those areas. Can the uh, Security Council name and shame or include on a list a group uh, whose conflict has not been officially recognized. And here we're looking at, for example, the recruitment of children in Mexico by drug cartels. Yeah, that's an interesting question. We had a lot of it during the day. As I was saying, you know, a lot of the work of the UN is defined by law and things like that. And so basically, um, to be in the Security Council, it has to be a peace and security issue, to some extent an armed conflict. And the reason why countries are so nervous to say, call something an armed conflict is because that immediately triggers the Geneva Conventions and protection for parties of the conflict. So you would then give uh, all these drug cartels and all the protection of parties and the Geneva Convention. So that's why people are very careful not to use armed conflict with regard to uh, the drug wars in Mexico. But the humanitarians, our ch UNICEF child protection people on the ground will say, but this is the issues they actually have to deal with day to day are identical to children in armed conflict. The way children are recruited, the way these gangs operate, many of them are former army or military personnel, so it's run like a military operation. This trauma and the psychology, psychological effects on children, et cetera, are very much like armed conflict. So the humanitarians want to try and see how we can work on this issue together with other parts. Um, but the lawyers are very clear that you keep this separate. Um, so, But there are other parts of the UN that are dealing with this issue. There's the UN uh, Office on Crimes and Drugs. There's a special representative on violence against children who deals looks at the issue of gangs. So I think we'll all have to work together. And what's the relationship of your office to the ICC? Do you actually refer perpetrators? How does that work? Yeah. Well, we can't refer. The Security Council can refer. At some point, perhaps they will. Um, but we, we, I file, I make a scurai with the uh, ICC. So there was the first case that the ICC decided to prosecute was uh, against Thomas Lubanga for the recruitment and use of children. So the first, their first case was on this issue. Uh, so uh, I filed an amicus curiae, basically urging a broad, uh, you know, uh, the point is, is for the first time in the history of the world, there's going to be an international um, uh, statement on what is a child soldier, or what is, what, what is recruitment and use, what is conscription, all this is going to be defined. So we were pushing for a broader definition, saying the nature of modern war is such that um, it should also include girls who have been uh, abducted, made into wives, but also into combatants, and that children play multiple roles in these rebel forces, and not go for a strict kind of uh, military notion of combatants. Uh, so that was one of the cases we, we spoke about, the girls being abducted by Lubanga's army in, in, uh, in, that, in the Congo. As wives, they're, 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 they're taken in, first raped and become wives, and at the same time, they're also uh, given a gun and trained to be combatants. So they had to be, play all these roles. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that the court didn't deal with this in a classic notion, but re understood the reality on the ground so that the girls can also get some justice. So we file amicus curiae and work with them uh, on some of these issues. Great. And the final couple of questions here. One is, um, most of us uh, who are here from the UN, I remember you special UN rapporteur on violence against uh -huh. women. Was this change to your new position in 2006 a difficult one, or were you ready to move on from that uh, period uh -huh. of your life? <laughs> well, of course, the women and children's issues are often very closely linked. I, I do remember that when Kofi Annan did call me and said he wanted to give me this, this position, I, th I said, you know, 
uh, I'm a specialist on women. He said, no, no, we want a human rights person and a, and a women's rights person it's the, in this uh, position. But I must say, the, I, there are, uh, I found, I, found uh, I didn't find it difficult because my main training has been in human rights, so, so there was a real challenge to deal with these children's issues. Uh, but um, there, is, there are commonalities, uh, and there are also differences between the children's and women's agenda, in the sense that when I was Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, I put a lot of emphasis on the agency and power, empowerment of women, uh, and less on sort of protecting them in this uh, way. You know, to, to me, to deal with a woman victim of violence is not to just lock her up in a room or something. It's to really empower her to make a life and let her uh, come about. With regard to children also, there's a need to ensure that they participate, that they express themselves. But of course, I think we have to also ensure that it's in a guided framework uh, and in a much more protective environment uh, than for, for, for women. Uh, so there is a difference between women and children, the response. So the violations are dreadful. Uh, but of course, I never left the women's movement, and whenever there's a women's event, I arrive there in, in, in uh, New York, so I'll probably see you there. <laughs> and I know you said that sometimes it's actually easier in this position to be a woman to get uh, some attention for, for the issue. Here's our last question, and I have a feeling it's from a WorldLink student in the room. It says, Anne Frank, in her diary, said that she still believed in the basic goodness of all people. With all the atrocities you see on a regular basis, do you agree or disagree with Ms. Frank's assessment, and why? Um, I, I, I believe that people uh, are basically good. Um, I, I, I really do. Um, in the sense that um, uh, maybe we're all idealists, uh, uh, I, I do believe that, um, uh, that the world uh, there are terrible atrocities, there is terrible evil in the world, but that people are good, and if they have leaders who bring out that goodness, then the society becomes good. I mean, I think we have the capacity for good and evil in all of us, but our environment and how our leaders uh, uh, deal with us depends which part of us will come forward or our own experience. But I've seen, as much as you see in these armed conflict situations, you see the best and worst of people. You see these terrible atrocities, but you see people doing ki all kinds of yeoman's work to protect each other, uh, to, uh, to care for each other, uh, to uh, a, a little boy to protect his little sister. You see the most extraordinary things, uh, and good things that people do as well. Yes, I believe man is basically good. Uh, and I, someone asked me, what quality do I look for in young people if I hire them? Uh, what skills? I said I looked to see if they had that little bit of idealism, that they believe that people are good, that they push for that idealism in a practical way. But without that basic belief in the goodness of man, a lot of this humanitarian work would not be possible. Thank you very much.